Good evening, one and all. I think we are at exactly 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, the 3rd of April, 2024. And I was just saying to Pascal before we came online at uh, Rand Swiss, where has this quarter gone to? Uh, even I'm getting very uh, much older and time is vanishing much faster than it was in my teens, or the year is just getting much faster. Uh, I've just come through reporting season which is probably the most intense period uh, that I have in uh, any one calendar year. And I can tell you without doubt, as I'm sure many of my colleagues and compatriots in the market will tell you, it has probably been one of the toughest, most intense reporting seasons that I've been through in a long, long time. And I've been doing this now uh, in this country for 30 years and covering underlying markets for the best part of 40 years. And this has been tough. And I'll go through some of the reasons why uh, as we do this fireside chat. Now, the reason I'm saying fireside chat is that you can see in the background, once again, I'm not in my home office. Uh, the joy of being an independent analyst working for oneself is you can work anywhere. None of my institutional clients actually care uh, where I'm actually based. All they want is the information. And generally, wherever I am, information follows me. So I'm now sitting in the Romans by Eco Estate, which is just the other side of Hans by. I've been here for a few days and I'm here up until Friday. And uh, what you can't see directly underneath me here uh, is my dog fast asleep. And what you can't see that way uh, is a fire uh, burning brightly with logs because the sun is beginning to set here. And as such, I'll be having a fireside chat. So I've done these before from Romans by. I'm always very informal, and if you see me reaching for my soft drink, it's because anyone who uh, speaks on camera, uh, doing live radio or television or a webinar tells you, but speaking for an hour, you generally get very hoarse. So let's run through what's basically happened in the last three months uh, of this uh, first quarter, which ended on the 28th of March. Uh, many of you know that I have a top stocks portfolio, and that tracks a basket of my selection of the stocks, which I think will outperform uh, the JSC small and mid cap index. And as of the close of quarter one, uh, the small cap index was only marginally ahead by 0.17%. Uh, the mid cap index was down 0.9%. And the all share index, again, as the point of when I updated this uh, note, uh, was down 1%, showing you but it's been a very difficult place to make money uh, in the overall JSE market, uh, depending on the, on the index you were invested in. However, if you were in selected special situations, you would have done quite well. Uh, as an example, one of my top stocks in the top nine, Arjun Industrial, year to date for the first three months is up 23.84%. We've got Libstar up 16.67%. Reunert up 12.83%, and my worst performer uh, in the first quarter, having been positive for the first couple of months, is now down 5.13%, which is Afrimat. And I'll run through uh, quite of those ideas during the course of this hour. The Q&A chat is open. Please feel free to, to drop Q&As. I will look uh, for ones coming through. And towards the end of this hour, uh, questions which are common uh, to the uh, Q&A chat box. Often people ask for similar questions, or if I'm able to answer uh, specific questions, I will. Otherwise, start dropping the Q&A. Should anybody be listening to me out there in the dark? I want to start off with uh, a topic which I know is very near and dear to the private client investor. How the hell can we actually spot what is going on in the market faster than analysts or faster than the institutional investor? And as I keep saying on these chats, the answer is you do have the ability to actually spot things much quicker than the institutional analyst or the institutional uh, fund manager. And I want to give one specific example. Many of you may have seen that Quantum Foods, which is a small cap, uh, animal feeds, um, poultry producer, 
and eggs business. They own the new laid eggs business uh, in this country. You could have bought that stock literally on the 27th of February, trading at four rand 25. It was a pedestrian stock. The stock has gone nowhere uh, for the best part of a year. The reason behind that is there are two opposing camps. On one side, you've got uh, Silverlands Private Equity, which owns roughly 31%. On the other side, you've got management owning roughly, call it 10 to 12%. And on the other side of the fence, you had Country Bird Holdings and Braemar Trading, which is basically the Rudlands tobacco empire. So you had two opposing camps fighting for control of a small 1 billion rand business. And then on the 5th of March, uh, a book over happened after the market had closed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And what a book over is, is an extraordinarily large parcel of stock, which doesn't go through the ordinary market because it's too big. It's a deal that is agreed between two parties for a certain price, for a certain value. And I noticed just after 5.30 p.m., the 5th of March, but 19.55 million shares in quantum foods had traded at 7 Rand 25, which was a significant premium to the close of quantum foods on that day, which is trading around 4 Rand 50. Now, you don't have to be a genius to understand if you follow a company and you read the annual report and you even look at Stock Press uh, or the JSE Handbook. But the only shareholder which owned 19.55 million shares was Astral Foods. Uh, that is public information in pretty much every domain you can cover. So my first thought when I saw that, given that Astral Foods has started accumulating that stock in Quantum Foods in July 2020, why would they be suddenly selling? And who could the potential buyer be? Now, under JSU rules, you have up to 24 to 72 hours to disclose uh, a transaction of that size. So again, as an analyst of reference uh, in the sector, uh, I had to play permutations. One, why would Astral sell? Two, who could the buyer be? Could it be perhaps they were selling to uh, the private equity buyer Silverlands, which were part of the uh, friendly crowd which were supporting Astral Foods? That would be unlikely because it would take them over the mandatory limit where they would then have to make an approach to buy out all the minorities. I didn't believe that management uh, would, were buying the stock because they were about to go into closed period. So then I thought, well, could the, uh, the tobacco barons in terms of Rudland or Braemar trading be buying? Well, again, they would have to do um, a, a mandatory offer because they would also breach the 34% level. So, and it led me to believe that probably the only uh, logical conclusion, it was Country Bird Holdings, who owned just over 6%, and by buying Astral's 9.8%, would take them to circa 16% to give them a, you know, a much uh, more uh, interesting stake to have discussions with Quantum Foods. But I was well aware that since the first approach was made by Country Bird Holdings, uh, for Quantum Foods back in 2020, that um, Quantum Foods was not interested in being taken over. So we now had two opposing camps with similar size stakes, and the remaining uh, independent shareholders could literally, as I was tweeting and commenting the press, could literally name their own price. Because whoever got a 50.1% could control this company. And as we've seen in the last month to six weeks, the share price of Quantum Foods has literally ran from 4 Rand 25. It closed today at 14 Rand 50. It was up 11.54% up today. And since uh, the book over took, uh, took place, it's up 241%. Now, we took the market a few days to cotton on to what was going on. But there was nothing to stop a private client investor in taking a calculated gamble and buying the stock anywhere between five and seven rand, hoping for some form of corporate action. And that's exactly what happened. I will be totally transparent. I do not own shares in Quantum Foods uh, because of the, uh, uh, the nature that I've covered this stock for 
God, nearly a decade. Um, it was part of Pioneer Foods. Then it was spun off in 2014. Um, I had a very strong inkling that uh, Country Boat Holdings was the potential buyer, but I had no definitive proof. And uh, as such, I, uh, I just assumed that it would be the buyer. And lo and behold, on March the 6th and March the 7th, Astral Foods disclosed that it sold the stake to Country Bird Holdings, and it became public domain. The share price still didn't move that uh, significantly. It was trading between 725 and 775. What's been happening in the last three weeks, as I've been uh, commenting on in the press, is that if you were the company and you didn't want to be taken over, you would do whatever it took to get hold of those independent shareholders to buy that stock at whatever price uh, you would pr be prepared to pay to keep the uh, offending party at bay. On the other side of the fence, if you were Country Bird Holdings and Braemart Trading, you would again be in the market to, uh, to buy shares. But to date, we have not seen Country Bird Holdings nor Braemart Trading increasing their stake. Uh, there's been no JSE requirements for them to disclose any increase in their stake. All the buying has come from allies associated with Quantum Foods, predominantly the chairman, Andrew Hanekom, who has spent probably between 10 and 14 million rand of his own money uh, to buy significantly larger parcels of stock as have come available. And yesterday, as an example, uh, there was a book over of 1% of Quantum Foods, which happened at aftermarket close at 15 rand 50 which was a significant premium to the prevailing trading price yesterday of 13 rand. I mentioned earlier it closed at 14 rand 50. So someone is prepared to pay 15 rand 50 to secure that 1% block to keep uh, the protagonist at bay. So I mentioned all of this just as interest that you are as a private individual able to cotton on to news and put two and two together and come up with maybe 4.25 and take and take what I would call a, um, a calculated scenario risk in buying stock when you think some form of corporate activity is on the go. And that's exactly what's happened in corporate food in quantum foods. It is the number one performing stock on the JSE this year. Its market value has gone from 1 billion rand to 2.615 billion rand. And if you'd bought in in late February, even into early March, you'd still be making a very, very healthy return on your money. So I say once again, do not feel, but as a private client, that you are at, uh, on the back foot when it comes to catching interesting plays. You just have to be nimble. You have to keep your eyes on sends and perhaps put two and two together faster than the institutions. And in this case, um, there was reasonable trade in that stock uh, in the days after the book uh, over happened and in the days when Astral Foods disclosed it has sold its 9.8% stake. Where do I think the price is going to go? I don't know. Do I think the share price could rise higher? I think it could, but I'm not advocating that uh, anyone on this webinar rushes out tomorrow to buy Quantum Foods. You are literally uh, picking up red hot coal under the fundamentals of this company based on purely uh, earnings-based scenarios. And where I think the broiler business, animal feed business, and the egg business is going, I do not believe that Quantum Foods is worth more than five Rand a share. So its current price at 14 Rand 50, uh, it's risen like a souffle, to use an analogy. But I think the egg could crack very quickly once the, uh, the buyers start to, um, to fall. And the, and the sales start to dry up. And once the magic 50.1 level has been gained, probably by allies associated with Quantum Foods, uh, there's, a, there's a game of musical roundabout or musical chairs. And I think the, the, the share price will then fall very, very quickly. And I also don't advocate you shorting the stock because one, you'll never be able to borrow the stock. Uh, and two, you'll probably never be able to cover. So I just mentioned this purely as an academic exercise to show to you that you actually can beat the market. And there aren't many small stocks out there that enable the private client shareholder 
to make over 200% literally in a month. I'm now going to go on and give a very brief discussion on reporting season. Reporting season was, was intense and hard this year, purely because Easter became early. Easter this year, as we all know, was on March the 29th until April the 1st. And as such, all the companies pulled their results forward uh, to get their numbers out into the marketplace. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the tidbits that I picked up with Easter being early this year, particularly as I've spoken to pretty much uh, all of the food companies from Astral Foods, Sea Harvest, Oceana, Libstar, Rhodes, Pioneer, Pi uh, Premier Foods, amongst others, even ABI. And again, again, history teaches you this. An early Easter is not good for retail sales in this country. Now, that seems counterintuitive because over a long weekend, you would think that citizens have nothing else to do. And they're going to go out with their families or their friends, and they're going to, they're going to go eat out, they're going to go have a few drinks, they're going to go shopping, hit the malls, and perhaps splurge, uh, given they're going to be at home, uh, hopefully over a warm Easter weekend uh, before autumn and winter hits. But as I try and advocate and remind most of the listeners to my webcasts and my in my institutional research, we listening to this uh, webcast of a podcam of a YouTube uh, uh, recording, which will come uh, via Rand Swiss in a few days' time, and not the bulk of the population. The bulk of the population in this country are sadly uh, poor, unemployed, uh, living in not great means, uh, mostly living on social grants. And sadly, uh, those social grants are not enough to basically get by. But uh, social grants this year were only paid after the Easter weekend. I was in the spa supermarket in Hansby earlier, uh, having a general discussion with some of the shoppers there. And there were long, long queues, as there were queues at all the ATMs and the shopping centers in Hansby. And it was people withdrawing their social grants, uh, their child support, their pensions, et cetera, et cetera, because they didn't have money before Easter. And many of the food companies were saying they expected a very weak and benign Easter trading period because the social grants were simply not paid. Now, that alone uh, is enough to impact the earnings of certain companies. I'll give you an example. Premier Group, which is the largest bread company in the country, they own Blue Ribbon, told me about an extra trading day on leap year this year, which was February the 29th, added three percentage points to the volumes of bread sold. And that can be material, given the, the marginal cost uh, of the producing the extra bread, but the uplift in sales. So I'm expecting many retail companies, when they start reporting uh, their quarterly updates to the end of March, uh, which won't include the Easter period to potentially indicate that the Easter sales, which were not included, will have impacted their um, retail and food sales up until the end of March or the quarter one. Something to bear in mind going forward when we start seeing the trading updates coming out from the food and the retail counters. Easter this year might be a washout. And that may be the same for the QSR, which is basically the quick service restaurants and the sit down fast food restaurants. It might not be as good as uh, many in the market anticipate. Anyone that shows a uh, positive growth is either gaining market share or clearly has a, an offering uh, which is appealing to the price conscious consumer. And I would think one company which would have done quite well over the, rest, over the Easter period would have been Spur Corporation, who have revamped their menu and have not increased their price points uh, significantly in the last period, purely because they know the consumer is looking for value and Spur Corporation is, is uh, offering value to that consumer. So a little tidbit there. I'm, not, I'm also now going to move on to another consumer stock, which has been a staple favorite of mine. Uh, from October 2022, when I recommended the count at 5 round 45 in uh, my normal institutional writings and in the financial mail. All of you uh, who get the financial mail, and particularly the month end supplement, where myself and many other analysts, like a financial ghost, Sean Stockett, 
uh, amongst others, uh, right, will get as much information as you would normally get uh, uh, from an institutional perspective. It just comes a wee bit later. But the same level of quality in the narrative is in that uh, investor monthly supplement. And I urge you all, not as marketing or as an analyst that uh, participates in writing the publication to read it, because you get some really good uh, sound bites. And uh, in the last financial mail, I did quite a few reviews, as did others, on a number of stocks. One stock which uh, only reported towards the end of March was CA Sales, or CAA is the ticker. It's currently trading at 11 Rand 48. Year to date, it's up 11.5%, so significantly better than the market as a whole. And in the last 12 months, it's up, um, looking at my numbers here, 53.5%. Uh, it was one of my top stocks of 2023, and for the year ended up 64%. It had uh, year-end sales to December, uh, which saw earnings up 25.3% to just under 98 cents. I thought we would, we would make a nice even round rand. But I would suggest that they've kept a bit of comfort in the uh, Sir Ramaphosa cushion uh, for slightly leaner times should it come ahead. But on a PE of, of 11.7 times, despite the stock having doubled from uh, October 2022, I still see upside in this company. Now, why am I still bullish on the company? Uh, many of you know what it, do, what it does. It basically distributes other people's um, food and consumer products in this country, but predominantly into Africa. Namibia, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho uh, is growing into, Zimb into Zimbabwe, growing into Zambia, and it's starting to move into East Africa in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. But its biggest market remains Botswana, South Africa, and of course, Namibia. Now, the company about a year and a half ago bought a Namibian company called TNC. Uh, it bought it from Bidvest, and they expect enormous growth coming from a Namibian market. Many of you on this webinar may realize that the Namibian economy, despite being an extremely large country and not being very populous, uh, doesn't have a huge population. I think from memory, it's around three or four million people. But it struck literally oil, lots of oil. And in the years to come, as those oil wells start delivering significant taxation and underlying economic benefits to the Namibian economy, that country is going to become the Bahrain or the Qatar of Africa. And as such a population is going to probably grow, uh, and there's going to be significantly more money sloshing around the Namibian economy. And what do people do? They spend. And they spend on consumer goods and improved living, which means food, alcohol, liquor, tobacco, pharmaceuticals. And that's exactly what CANS does. So as African countries start to become more urbanized and more prosperous, you start to see the population demanding more of the goods and services that we as citizens of this country take for granted by walking into ShopRite, Checkers, Boxer, Pick and Pay, Woolworths, et cetera, et cetera, which perhaps are not as readily available in certain African countries. And there is a much more rural and informal uh, sales patterns in those countries, which CANS is expert and adept in moving products, which we take for granted, uh, into those countries. They recently announced, for example, they bought Roots Trading in South Africa. Now, I know Roots Trading is the uh, distribution agent for Pernod Ricard, uh, the French liquor giant. I know this because they're based in the Cape Quarter, where I live in, in, uh, in Cape Town. They own Ballantine's Whiskey, Absolute Vodka, Red Heart, uh, the Glenlivet Whiskey, uh, a combination of low, mid, and very high-end uh, products. Interestingly, Roots um, has an underlying value in revenue to Pernod Ricard of 922 million rand, and that's just one sales distribution point. And their main area of distribution is into the rural areas in this country, where they deliver to 8,000 rural areas. So I asked Duncan Lewis, the CEO, on March 27th, why would he buy the company delivering what is predominantly high-end alcohol products into what is a rural community? It doesn't make natural sense. 
and he quickly chastised me saying that Anthony in the rural areas there is a very fast growing population which has aspirations to, to own or wants to serve or drink premier brands it's seen as an event so when there's a a, 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 a christening a, a wedding a funeral or even a party there is a desire to be, to buy and offer the guests and the hosts and aspirational brands and as such all of these high-end alcohol products do extremely well thank you in these rural areas which is why they bought roots trading uh, to get access into those rural areas and to then piggyback onto that uh, distribution network with other products they have in their basket so canS basically grows by putting more goods in its existing in its existing basket and growing into those areas where it which is underserved by the mass formal retail segment so canS has revenue of around 11 billion rand they are very very confident that they will get that at 20 billion rand within four years and possibly exceed it and as the aspirational um urban classes and rural classes grow uh, canS is adeptly uh, placed to grow into servicing those areas so even though some of you may have uh, missed the boat buying the stock uh you know in the five six and seven rands even at 11 rand 48 uh which i said is year to date up 11.5 percent for any long-term growth portfolio on a three to five year basis if you want a total quality 5.5 billion rand stock which you are happily tucking away in your pension fund or investment club or stock fell or even your small embryonic uh, investment uh, portfolio i would absolutely re recommend canf it's one of those stocks that uh, widows and orphans can happily buy quality management uh, great positioning and the area of the economy they operate in both in this country and in africa has natural growth tendencies But not everything in the uh, garden, as I say, is a bed of roses. Uh, Afrimat, which has been a perpetual favorite of mine for many, many years, started the year extremely well. I know was riding high. The market was looking forward for, to a bumper results uh, to the February year end, and they still will be quite good. Uh, I'm forecasting that Afrimat will probably have earnings for the period uh, probably up 22% to about 5 Rand 60, uh, which is still a good growth year on year, given that interim results were only up roughly 4 to 5%. But year to date, the stock is down just over 6.5%. Now, why is that if the underlying fundamentals seem so sound? The answer is iron ore. Iron ore remains one of the largest players inside Afrimat, even though its composition. Uh, to the underlying profit of a company is diminishing because of the growth of the Uncomati anthracite operation, which is now coming fully on stream. Uh, iron ore peaked uh, this year at $144 a ton in early January. And as I updated my spreadsheet before coming online, it is now at $100 dead. So it's down 30%. And the RAND literally year to date is basically flat against the dollar at roughly 1880 so there's been no rand tra translation benefits so for someone like kumba or afrimat where a, 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 a material proportion of its revenue comes from a profitability of iron ore they're going to see 30 percent lower profits from iron ore uh, from their export line however not all of afrimat's iron ore comes from export the market consistently forgets that their, their export volumes is capped at roughly 900,000 tonnes because of the logistic bottleneck on the Saldana line from Transnet. A significant proportion of Afrimat's iron ore is going to fund uh, the furnaces of ArcelorMittal, and that's a captive domestic market. So even though Afrimat sells his iron ore at less than 50% of spot to ArcelorMittal, which might not sound like a great deal, it only costs Afrimat 300 rand a ton to basically dig the stuff up in the Northern Cape. I mean, it's up to ArcelorMittal to pick it up 
and transport it at their own cost. So even selling at a marginal rate of half spot, they're making significant profits because it costs them roughly 300 rand a ton and they're selling anything from a blended price between, call it 850 and 950 rand a ton. So they're getting increasing volumes going to ACML. That helps offset the weakness in the export line. You then factor in that the construction material side is continuing to do extremely well. And that was commented on in the pre-closed update, which occurred a few weeks ago. And as I mentioned there, Unkamati anthracite now has moved last year from 362,000 tons to eventually peak at 600,000 tons a year. That will become a material profit contributor to Afrimat. I estimate, depending on the volumes that that company will do, which is Unkamati, they could make between 30 and 50 million rand a month in profit just from that mine. And it was loss making a couple of years ago. So that will certainly offset a significant proportion of any downturn in iron ore. Now, anyone that follows the Chinese market knows that the Chinese property market currently, quite frankly, is gone to hell in a handcart. The consumer's not spending. Many large companies in China have gone bust. And the shadow banking market has got trillions of dollars of potential losses uh, in economic loans to the property and construction sector. But the Chinese government will probably ride to the rescue, hopefully. And in the last uh, few weeks, the, the Reserve Bank of China has lowered the amount of money that the banking system has to keep uh, in reserve to try and stimulate the underlying economic stagnation in that country and to try and to try and prop up a property market. So there's more that can be done there. So many believe that the iron ore market, whilst it's currently in a slump because of the underlying fundamentals in the economy, Hopefully, the Chinese government, if it wants to get to its 5 to 6% GDP growth targets, which were recently announced at the annual gathering of a Communist Party Congress, they're going to have to prime the pump, try and push money into the economy, and that economy will need to be primed or kick-started by infrastructure and construction. And as such, iron ore should hopefully pick up. Right now, iron ore ain't going anywhere. And as such, Afrimet and Kumba have felt the force of that weakness, but Kumba more so than Afrimat. Afrimat seems to be stabilizing. It's trading today at 57 Rand 80, and it seems to be holding the line. Uh, results are normally out in the middle of March, and I'm anticipating a trading update, which normally comes out towards the end of uh, April. And as I'm saying, it'll have to be a traditional JSE trading update, which is anything above 20% has to have a trading update. And I'm forecasting a minimum of 5 Rand 60, which is up, as I said, about 22%. So I'm maintaining the line uh, with a buy on Afrimat with a target price of 80 Rand, despite it being down 5 point, sorry, 6.43% year to date. As you can see, the light is changing in my house. Uh, the fire is uh, burning brightly to my, to my right. And I'm going to take a quick sip of water here. And to keep an eye on the time, it's 19.02. Let me just scroll, scroll down the questions. Keep the questions coming. And uh, I'll try and get to as many as I can to give a little bit more time for question and answers uh, in this one-hour webinar. I now want to uh, mention a very interesting uh, stock, one which was my wild card in 2024, which is Libstar. And I've gone on record by saying for the last two years, I have gotten this, this stock totally, totally wrong. Uh, when it was trading in the fours, fives, and six rands a share, I had a buy in the stock, and quite frankly, I got it wrong. And I admitted that late last year, when the share price hit an intraday low uh, of around three rands. But then a couple of interesting things happened at the tail end of last year which again, if you keep your ear close to the ground and you start joining the dots, uh, sometimes can get you uh, the ability to take a calculated risk on buying a stock which perhaps is bombed out. All of this information is in the general public domain, but again, with most small to mid caps, you actually have to do the digging 
and the reading to consistently follow what is going on. Many times it is not often reported directly by the company, but you can keep an eye on what's going around the company. In Lipstar's case, uh, it's a 2.5, 2.6 billion rand uh, food producer. Uh, it's a major supply of products to Woolworths, Checkers, and uh, other leading retailers. And many of the brands that you would have in your cupboards, they would supply, uh, like Laughing, Laughing Cow Cheese, Baby Bell, Lurpak, Tabasco, a Gold Crest Food, amongst others. They're also the leading providers of chicken schnitzels to Woolworths, which, by the way, is the third largest selling uh, stock keeping unit, or SKU, inside Woolworths. It's a huge category. Chicken schnitzels, who would have believed? But everybody loves a Woolworths chicken schnitzel, including me. Lipstar. Uh, late last year looked interesting because the market believed that the earnings would be down on last year's 45 cents a share. But I was of a belief that earnings would be slightly better than market expectations because despite the fact that they had a horrendous first half, where earnings crashed to 10.5 cents a share, I believe that they report better year-on-year -year earnings. And I went out on a limb, stating that to me that Libstar was my wild card and Due to the fact that uh, all the underlying operating metrics inside Libstar, in terms of debt reduction, underlying trading, operational efficiencies, loss-making businesses moving back into profits, uh, were all actually playing out in Libstar's favor. And the young CEO, Charles de Villiers, was basically in the hot seat to turn this company around and the floundering share price. But the real thing that sparked my interest is that roughly 40%, 40% of Libstar is owned by a UK private equity fund called Actis. Actis was basically um, targeted by a US private equity fund, and that transaction happened earlier this year. So you now have an American private equity fund having bought out a UK private equity fund, which has the largest stake in Libstar. Now, in the greater portfolio of this American fund, Libstar is point bugger all percent in the overall valuation of its multi-billion dollar fund. And the mandate for that fund is expiring uh, in the next year or two. So I had to believe, well, if the Americans have got hold of a stock, uh, and given that the Americans are not exactly fond of investing in South Africa, given the political affiliations of this country, and the fact that uh, we seem to align ourselves uh, with uh, with nations that perhaps have uh, tendencies which are not very friendly towards the uh, United States. If you think of uh, Cuba, Russia, North Korea, Iran, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I thought, well, perhaps the Americans will dump the stock or sell it in due course. That's a wild assumption to make. But sometimes analysts have to make wild assumptions to try and get hold of the story. And sometimes two plus two do make four and a half. So I thought, well, perhaps they'll sell. Uh, and it was a good enough story for me to weave into my underlying narrative, because I love mosaic theory, where you take tiny piece of information and you start building a little piece of cloth, and that piece of cloth becomes a large bolt of cloth, and from that bolt of cloth, you cut a story. And that's what I tend to do. It can sometimes take years to have enough cloth to cut a story. So perhaps I was two years too early with Libstar. Now the story is running. As I mentioned to you, I chose Libstar as my wildcard stock. Beginning of this year at three rand thirty, it closed today at three rand ninety. The stock is soaring; it's doing extremely well. Uh, it's up year to date, uh, nearly set nearly nineteen percent, which is not bad for a what was a crappy food company uh, operating in a fairly crappy sector. And I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, it's actually outperforming most food companies, ex excluding Quantum Foods which is a special situation takeover play. So Libstar, as we stand, is trading at three rand 90. Interestingly, one of my competitors in the field, Anthony Geard, who is a dear friend of mine, uh, who works for Investec Securities, uh, has been slating the stock for quite some time. Today, he changed his mind and came out with a far more positive view. So as I call him, young Anthony changed his view to match to match old Anthony, except he's 19% too late. Uh, I caught the easy money, and now he's playing catch-up. 
So you now have a very influential, powerful institution in terms of Investec Securities now changing their tune on a company which they've been negative on for quite some time. And that hopefully will, will resonate amongst the institutions and they'll start looking at the stock. But I was there three months ago. So in my, in my line, um, Libstar remains an interesting special situation. I still believe that the stock in, uh, in the next 12 months will be a, a takeover candidate, and it certainly will not be at three rand 90. The company listed itself uh, about five or six years ago at 12 rand 50, and it has a basket of brands, uh, either as a constituent, as a whole, or as a breaker, which is worth significantly more than three rand 90. I guesstimate that the stock is worth at least seven rand 50 to eight rand 50. So if my wild card is correct, uh, either on a fundamental basis or on a breakup situation is worth more than three rand 90. So let's see. So I'm still sticking my neck out at that uh, Libstar at three rand 90, despite a lot of the easy money being made, still has legs. I'm going to caveat uh, to all listening uh, in this live webcast or on the future YouTube uh, via Rand Swiss, that it is high risk. Do not be putting your pension fund money or your stock felt money or your grocery money or your hard earned money into Lipstar hoping to make a quick return. This is pure speculation. It is, it is a wild card, but I think it is a wild card which has what I would call the element of promise. So only time will tell. Looking at some of the other stocks on my top uh, nine, which I'll remind you once again, were Afrimat, Argent, Astral Foods, Kura Holdings, KAL Group, formerly Carp Abri, Lipstar, Novus Holdings, Premier, and Roynut. Um, an interesting stock in March was Premier, which is the country's largest bread producer. Breit, which is one of a, which is one of the largest shareholders alongside a uh, billionaire investor, Christo Visa, via his Titan Investment Holding Company. And Christo Visa, for those of you who may know, uh, is the uh, large shareholder in ShopRite Checkers. Uh, he is the single largest shareholder in Premier, owning roughly 44%. Uh, Breit sold 15 million shares in the month at 60 rand a share. The share price at its high in March was trading just under 70 Rand. It is today trading at roughly uh, 61 Rand and some change. I think the stock will trend sideways for quite some time because the market has gained significant liquidity by 15 million shares being placed into institutional hands. Alan Gray, the blue chip investor, disclosed it owns just under 11% of Premier uh, in the last week or so. They are a March reporting period, and I'm expecting a very good trading update to come from the company, having uh, seen interim results of 26%. I spoke to the company just ahead of its closed period, and they indicate to me that they see significant benefits coming through from material investment in their bakeries. And even though the earnings to date have been good, they're saying that the benefits from their investment in the bakeries and the efficiencies in their entire value chain alongside lower like-on-like -like wheat prices, which hit 8,000 rand a ton uh, post the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And wheat is now down to roughly uh, 6,105 rand a ton. They, are, they see that continuing to provide significant benefits to the company's profile for the next two years. Um, I like Premier. I don't own it myself yet, because my view is if a market is full of stock and the share price is going nowhere, and we are going into a period of potential market volatility, because we have... A little national election happening on May the 29th, which could see significant uh, displacement of value, depending on which way uh, the polls go. Uh, if the ANC wins and they don't need to do a coalition, then the market will breathe a sigh of relief and we might see a relief rally. Uh, if the ANC goes you know, 
to the significant downside below 50%, and they then have to do a coalition with any party, depending on who that party is, the EFF or who knows, even the MK party, heaven forbid, or even the DA, which could be the golden ticket, um, there will be a period of significant market volatility. So I'm prepared to wait to see which way the election goes. And I'm uh, assuming that this market volatility will give me an option to buy Premier uh, at a lower price than the current level of 61 and ran some change into that period of market uncertainty. In the longer term, I want to have Premier in my pension fund portfolio. I've gone on public record for the last 12 months stating it is possibly the best management of any food manufacturing company listed on the JSC. And that's a very bold call to make. They're doing all the right things, and they're also looking for um, accretive targets to build their capacity in the grocery business. Because currently they're predominantly in the Wheaton chain. They own some um, some confectionery brands and some uh, uh, what I would call uh, household uh, personal care brands. But they're looking to grow their groceries division. There are a number of potential targets out there. Maybe Libstar's one. Who knows? Uh, and I think that uh, Premier is one of those stocks that I want to have in my portfolio for longer term. An 8 billion rand business, round numbers. Uh, there is an element of concern at Breit, which now owns 22%, will start selling more shares to fund its own debt obligations. But I think Premier, below 60 rand, is certainly one that I would put on my watch list going forward for any fund which wants to have a quality uh, food defensive stock in their portfolio in the longer term. Uh, everybody has to eat. Bread is a basic of life. And if they start to grow their grocery division in the years to come, knowing the quality of this management, I think they will extract significant benefits. And Premier to me, if I could buy the stock in the 55 to 58 rand range on what I colloquially call an off a day, I would happily do it. So uh, get your pencils out and uh, make a, a mental note of that. I think Premier uh, between 55 and 58 is absolutely a stock that I would want to own in my portfolio. So I'm looking at my little clock here, and it's exactly quarter past seven. I'm going to take another sippy. Put my notes to one side and start scrolling through the questions. So please give me a moment, given that uh, my eyesight has gone to hell because I'm getting old. A question from Rianne. Thank you. Your current view on sea harvest. I saw today that sea harvest hit a 52-week low. Uh, the four new 52-week lows today were all stocks that I cover. Metrophile, York Timbers, Sea Harvest, and there was one other that'll, that'll suddenly come to me. It was... I've suddenly gone blank. There were, there were four stocks that hit 52-week lows, and Sea Harvest was one of them. Um, I am well aware that the PRC has been selling. They were the second largest shareholder uh, in the company after the empowerment fund Brimstone. Sea Harvest recently had results for the year ending December. And earnings came in at exactly one rand, down roughly 5% year to date. Now, since the company listed about five or six years ago, quite frankly, the stock peaked at 16 rand 50. And for the last four years, it's gone one way, down. Uh, a combination of that has been very weak fishing uh, um, uh, conditions, because an El Nino in the sea means it is, uh, sorry, a La Nina on the land means the sea is not very favorable for fish. They tend to move to colder, deeper water. We are now moving into a El Nino, where it's hot on land, but the sea warms up, and the fish then come back nearer to shore. So the likes of a sea harvest, which is involved in hake fishing, has not had a good period in terms of its fishing. Even though fish is in significant international demand, given the, the health-conscious nature, nature of global consumers, but sadly, 
as I've written uh, in my institutional works, for a market cap of two and a half billion rand, Sea Harvest to date has spent three and a half billion rand on acquisitions which have basically added no material value. Uh, they bought Viking fishing, they bought Viking aquaculture, they, they bought Ladysmith cheese, they bought Moy Valley, BM Foods, and their latest 1.2 billion rand transaction funded with 300 million rand of debt and a significant placement of shares to the private equity seller uh, is a company called Terrasan, which operates literally where I am here in Hansby. They're involved in pelagic fish and aquaculture. Having had a discussion with Felix Rateb, the CEO, and Mowbray, the CEO, a few weeks ago, I felt at 8 Rand 50, uh, the worst of a company's performance would be over because a combination of Terrasan and the existing fish business with a changing in the climatic conditions at sea should hopefully see a much better fishing uh, progress for, for sea harvest in the next 12 months. I've also written that given the substantial debt pile inside Sea Harvest, uh, it is my view, and my view alone, that one way they can reduce their current debt situation, which is greater than the current market cap, which is never a great position to be in, is to sell an asset. And the, the asset which looks completely out of place inside a fishing company called Sea Harvest is Cape Harvest Foods which encompasses all the dairy business and all the foods business, which I think could be worth 800 to a billion rand. And I would imagine at some point, the board will have a hard, a hard discussion and eventually sell the foods business to bring debt down to maybe 1.8 billion, focus on fishing. And I think then the market will re-rate the company because currently the foods business is nothing more than a distraction and is not uh, returning the profitability it should. So that's my tuppence worth. So even though today Sea Harvest is trading at a 52-week low, I think it closed at around 8 rand and 2 cents to 8 rand and 4 cents. Uh, I would keep an eye on it. And as I said, at some point, uh, it will turn. Where will that point be? Well, as I said, we're going into an uncertain period of volatility in this country with an election on May the 29th. So I would use uh, the timeline between today and after the election to write a little list to myself of stocks that I think look interesting but might get cheaper. And the sea harvest is certainly one of those. I have a target value of sea harvest of 10 Rand 50. Uh, I don't own sea harvest. I want to own sea harvest if I believe they will sell the foods division, if I believe the debt will come down, and if I believe a Terrasan business will be the transformative transaction but will galvanize and give material scale to their fishing business. They will then give Oceana a run for their money. And I think that Sea Harvest is, is down in its luck, that a lot of the stock from uh, the PRC is depressed for share price. And I think that uh, it looks interesting, but not quite yet. Again, I would put my pencil out and say, I would happily buy a Sea Harvest at around 7 Rand 50, sit back and wait. At 7 Rand 50, given the earnings base last year of a Rand, that's a P of 7.5. That's a material discount to Oceana. And if the earnings start coming through, despite the dilution coming from the Terrasan share placement, uh, I think the stock looks very, very interesting. Let's moving on. Uh, Anthony uh, from Eugene. Anthony, two stocks to keep an eye on, Cap Industries and Mustex. Thoughts, please. Cap Industries is a company that I've only, I've only started building a file on in the last 12 months. And anybody that knows me knows I take at least two years to build up a significant file on any company, to kick the proverbial management tires, to go and see the underlying assets and to understand the business. So I can't give you a comment on Cap. Mustek is very interesting. Uh, if any of you read my... Um, column in last month's financial mail, which came out at the end of March. Mustek is a stock which I believe offers significant promise for a potential buyout. Uh, earnings have been weak because of the fall off in demand for renewable energy and solar panels and power backups, because quite frankly, people are spending the money on other things. 
and the sector has become incredibly competitive and renewable energy and battery solutions were the fastest growing element inside Nasdaq. And that took a particular hit at the interim results. I think they were down over 50%. The share price has taken a bit of a, bit of a snot clop and I think is now trading below 10 Rand. Uh, I still believe with a net asset value of 28 Rand a share with the, the founder having sadly passed away last year. And he was a friend of mine and I've known David Can and his family for many, many years. Uh, I think at some point management and the single largest shareholder, which is um, the family and private equity, which is in terms of old mutual, will take the company private. I have no uh, definitive uh, 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 qualification of this. It is purely my view that with a stock trading at 28 Rand and a share price below 10 Rand, at some point, somebody will make a play for it. Someone like Udeco or another industrial company or the company will just take itself private because the market is not seeing the inherent value inside Mustac. So below 10 Rand, I see there's a special situation in play. And I think it has value to 15 to 18 Rand. Read my column in last month's Investors Chronicle, sorry, Investors Monthly. It'll give you a fair bit of information. Another interesting question from she from Sean. What is a blessed platform to follow you on? Excuse me. The fire is going here, and this side of my of my of my uh, body is being toasted. The best platform to follow me on is Twitter, uh, Small Talk Daily, or reading my columns in the Financial Mail, which comes out at the end of every month, where I generally write approximately 25 to 30% of the entire magazine, along with my dear friend, the Financial Ghost, amongst others. So I'm not going to take all the glory to myself. It's a team effort, and the team is probably, I think, one of the best uh, in this country in putting together a financial magazine. I'm an institutional analyst. Uh, much of the work that I do for the likes of Rand Swiss, uh, the Investors Monthly, my commentary to the media, amongst others, is just the work that I do uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a give back to the sector and uh, as a, as a sideline uh, element to my natural institutional works. Uh, my general institutional works is not available to the, to the general public, but uh, the likes of the Rand Swiss, who are institutional clients of mine, do get their uh, hands on my work. So anyone that is a client of Rand Swiss uh, is more than likely able to access my content. So uh, if you're listening to this and you're not a client of Rand Swiss, uh, I'm not giving them a plug. I'm just telling uh, Sean, if you want my content, then Rand Swiss probably has it. Um, scrolling down, bear with me a second. Again from Sean, what platform has highlighted the unusual sale of shares of quantum foods. Um, again, uh, that is commonly available information. Uh, if you have uh, any form of trading screen uh, on any of these sophisticated uh, private client trading platforms, Standard Bank, Investec, et cetera, et cetera, you would have seen the book over actually going through the market at 5.30 p.m., I think on March the 5th. Uh, I guarantee most people didn't see it because most people are not looking at Quantum Foods, which is an illiquid little company valued at a billion rand. But I have a watch list of approximately 78 companies. And I saw this flagged. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. What is that? And then I saw 19.55 million shares. And given I've covered the stock for probably 10 years, uh, I knew that 19.55 million shares could only be one person, Astral Foods which got me thinking, if Astral Foods is selling, why are they selling? Why now? Who could be the buyer? So in that case, it was purely me spotting a book over, which was actually on the trading screen at 5.30 p.m. Uh, I think I even posted that particular screenshot on my Twitter page, I think from memory. Uh, have a look. Let me scroll down a bit, for, bit further. Uh, did I mention Arjun Industrial? Uh, maybe I did. I can't remember. I'm getting old, you see. The question is from uh, from Bob. Hello, Bob. 
Argent has built up a significant cash pile. They haven't done an acquisition in over two years. Do you think they will return the cash to shareholders? Well, Bob, um, you have seen that Argent for the last few years um, has actually significantly um, bought back a huge quantum of their own stock. I think from memory, they've bought back 38% of their shares in issue, and they're still buying the shares back. Most of the deals that they have done year to date have been offshore and predominantly happened around COVID when companies in the UK and post-Brexit were selling at bargain basement prices. And I'll give you an example. They bought a fuel company called Fuel Transfer and Fuel Proof, which basically provide fuel at airports in the UK or selected airports and manufacture um, regulated and safety conscious uh, containers to move fuel around, uh, either to on farms, uh, to industry, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if you want to move a thousand liters around, uh, you're not exactly going to put it in a in a plastic bag in the back in the back of a bucky, particularly in the UK, which has health and safety coming out of its arsehole. So they bought this company for the grand sum of one pound, and then uh, a loan account from memory of one point three billion pounds, which in round numbers back then was circa, uh, pick a round number, round numbers twenty five million rand. So it was a it was a bargain basement price. The, the value of that company right now, if you were to sell it, I estimate is half a billion rand, which is half the current market value of Argent. They also sit on roughly 300 million rand of cash, which most of it is offshore in dollars, pounds and euros. They're still buying back shares. And yes, I think uh, the CEO, Treve Henry, at some point, if he sees an interesting bolt-on transaction, at a bargain basement price, uh, probably offshore, unless something interesting catches his eye, cheap and shareful in this country, will continue to return shares to shareholders in terms of dividends and or share buybacks. I hope that answers your question, Bob. Uh, 1929, let's see if I can get a sneaky question in before, before Pascal starts shouting at me. Let me have a quick look. Uh, I was a quick question from Robert on NAMPAC. Uh, all I will say is um, I was at the NAMPAC AGM a little while ago, and I think that NAMPAC is performing significantly better than the market is led is is than the market uh, understands. The sale of liquid cartons has occurred. Um, the company did indicate uh, in their last, last update that the sale of liquid cartons and Nigeria would happen this year. Liquid cartons has been sold for 450 million rand, perhaps a little bit light of what the market is looking for, but it was sold reducing debt. I still estimate Nigeria will be sold. So I have no reason to believe that the uh, narrative that NAMPAC has put out, that the, it'll be a much different company by the end of 24 than it was at the end of 23 will not come true. And I will just say that I think that Phil Rue is doing a, a much better job than the wider market actually understand or sees. And I think that will be evident in the results and the optics that NAMPAC will start to deliver in the next couple of months. Uh, let me see one last sneaky question, if I can, if I get this thing down. Astral Foods, good question. I was going to bring it up. It's trading today at, um, it's, it's actually quite weak. It's trading at about 131, 132, 132 rand. Um, it had a very good trading update uh, a month ago with earnings up 300% to so between 6 Rand 47 to 6 Rand 54. But what we've seen in the last few weeks is the underlying soft commodity price has started to run because the harvest in this country has been cut. Last year, the maize harvest in this country was 16.43 million tonnes. The current crop estimate committee forecast this year 
is 13.3 million tonnes, and I estimate it'll go down into 12 million tonnes, which is why the price is going up. So even though Astral and many other poultry and food companies have hedged their procurement of maize around the 3,800 rand a ton level, which means their earnings up until September will probably be fine. When, when they start renewing or rolling over their hedges, it'll be at materially higher prices. And there'll probably be a five or 600 rand a ton smack uh, to their profitability. And if it's someone like Astral buying 803,000 tons of maize a year and 240,000 tons of soya, there will be some margin compression. It also doesn't help for our little communist uh, minister of uh, 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 industry or DTI, Minister Patel, uh, is investigating the chicken sector for uh, abuse of power, which is complete poppycock. If you, want to, if you want to investigate abuse of power in the chicken industry, investigate ShopRite, who are the single largest buyer in this chicken, of chicken in this country, and quite frankly, dictates the prices. Granted, prices are declining because of an oversupply, because the QSR sector, which is, the, which is basically the likes of, a Q, of, a, of a KFC, is not buying enough because consumers are not buying enough KFC, a dumping product into the IQF market, which is a two kg, kg bag of frozen products, and they're depressing the IQF, IQF market. Astral is a very efficient producer. I think the market has got a bit of a fright because of the uh, rise in the maize price. I think they've got a bit of a fright because the IQF market is now falling from 36 rand a, uh, a kilogram to 32. Astral needs to get price increases through. That is going to be very difficult. So I think the market is right to push Astral lower, but I think at these sort of levels, um, I wouldn't run out and buy it. But I think, as I said, we are moving into uncharted territory regarding the election coming in March, sorry, in May the 29th. We've seen a very weak consumer, and I would certainly keep an eye on the stock. I, I don't know if you own the stock. I don't know if you're just hanging on to buy or interested. But I will certainly see the stock potentially moving lower. And if I were to be a, a gambling man, if I could buy the stock around the 120 to 125 level, which is its historic lows, lows I certainly would. Uh, I think the company is an extremely astute player, but it has a number of headwinds against it regarding industry investigations, which I think have no merit, uh, imports picking up, and of course, the underlying maize price. From me, I can see that Pascal probably wants to go home and cook supper for, for Gary. I'm going to wish you all a very happy evening. I'm going to wish you all uh, luck ahead of the elections and what will be extreme market volatility, particularly in the small to mid caps, particularly the small cap market, where jittery funds will want to exit and raise cash. And the same in the mid cap market, where greater liquidity will see funds want to exit to raise funds and perhaps kick back and wait for bargain basement prices after the election. So I foresee the next couple of months, if I rub my crystal ball, being far more volatile in the uh, small to mid cap space. My top nine so far is holding the line and performing significantly better than market. But I have seen a bit of a deterioration in the last couple of days. But as long as I'm above market, I'm a happy bunny. In that note, keep an eye out for the Financial Mail Investors Monthly at the end of this month. There'll be some interesting uh, comments that I've made on the food sector, quantum foods, and uh, some other stocks like Bell Equipment and CANS. To Pascal and Gary at Rand Swiss and the entire team, thank you one and all for listening. And to you listening in the dock, I would urge you to also listen to the YouTube that'll be coming out of this presentation uh, in a few days. And for those that think that um, listening into a webinar is not worth your while, a lot of the information I've given you right now will only be seen by the wider public in the webinar in days to come. If you listen to me live, you get that information days ahead of the YouTube. 
So something to bear in mind the next time that Rand Swiss or Small Talk Daily puts out a fireside chat. For me, going over time, and with Pascal probably screaming at me, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Uh, be safe out there. Make a note of the stocks that I think you should keep an eye on, and I'll see you in the next quarter. Thank you one and all, and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Take care.